lessons I have to set up and everything takes a few minutes. I might as well do two, but just the timing and I still have my run to do and all of that. But I just wanted to get one done because usually I like procrastinate before my run or, you know, drink my coffee, whatever, for like 40 minutes at least. So that's the length of the video. So I might as well do one and it won't be much later before I get out for my run. I'd say um, the only thing is my phone is only on 20% and I'm using it to go with the camera for this video. I'm not sure why that is. It must be that I either didn't plug it in or sometimes I plug it in but I forget to put on the on button of the power the switch so it could be that. But um, yeah, just because I am going away and I've honestly been quite good at doing the editing, getting ahead because I know I'm in a bit of a time crunch. So when I film the new ones, I want to be ready to edit the new ones. So basically, yeah, I think we're going to edit this one today or tomorrow, like finishing up the one I'm editing, do thumbnails, etc. And then I'm going to do Saturdays, then I'm going to be ready to edit Saturdays, Saturday or the next day, etc. So I'm doing pretty okay. I'm not sure. I probably won't have ones for the whole duration, etc. But yeah, we will see. And the closer and closer it gets to the date, the less likely I'm going to be able to edit them in advance because I'll probably do other things like packing, etc. But either way, today's video is going to be about history's greatest romances. And a little disclaimer is that I'm not saying any of these are, I don't know, some of these could be controversial, whatever. I'm not like romanticizing the romances. I'm just saying about them because there was something about Henry VIII and I was like, okay, who knows where this is going. But um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. So, um, history has taught us that, as Shakespeare put it, the course of true love never did run smooth. In fact, a quick, a quick scroll, the greatest love affairs in history revealed that many of the lovers met a tragic end. This is inspired by the love letters of great men and women. Here's our choice of the greatest, most doomed love stories of all time. So I didn't know there was that doomed element, but that's interesting as well. So Napoleon and Josephine. So Napoleon Bonaparte to Josephine at Milan, uh, sent from Verona, 13th November, 1796. I do not love thee any more. On the contrary, I detest thee. Thou art horrid, very awkward, very stupid, a very Cinderella. Thou dost not write me at all. Thou dost not love thy husband. Thou knows the pleasure that thy pleasures afford him. And thou dost not write him six signs or of even a haphazard scribble. Napoleon, the humble soldier from Corsica who became a great general and emperor of France, married Josephine de Bolognese in March 1796. She was an impoverished Creole aristocrat from the French colony of Martinique with two children from an earlier marriage. These lines come from a leisure written shortly after their wedding when Napoleon had become commander of the French forces in Italy. In these letters, Napoleon casts himself as supplicant at the mercy of his beautiful, hard-hearted wife. There is something touching and almost comical about his anxious pursuit of Josephine all over Italy while conducting the military campaign that would make his name. It became clear to both later on in their marriage that neither had remained faithful, and Josephine's extravagance was a constant source of friction between them. But it seems from these early letters that Napoleon was very much in love with his wife. Napoleon divorced Josephine in 1810 to marry Archduchess Mary Louise of Austria in order to gain an heir and secure the succession. Josephine continued to live near Paris and remained on good terms with her former husband until she died in 1814. After his defeat by the British, Napoleon was exiled to the island of St. Helena in 1815, where he died six years later. So, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert... Did they say divorce? Yeah. Yeah, they, I thought that was kind of like early for divorce. I thought in some days you were just, if you're married, you're kind of stuck with them or, you know, 
something like that, but I, I think it's just because I read somewhere that divorce was only legalized, I don't know when in different countries, but divorce was only legalized in Ireland in 1995, which sounds crazy, um, and it was like, you know, by referendum, etc., but let's look up like France or something. Oh, 1790, 1792. In Ireland, it was actually literally 1995, which is actually crazy. I don't know what people did before then, but Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So Queen Victoria to Prince Albert, sent from Buckingham Palace, the 31st of January, 1840. So it seems like a lot of these are letters. You forget, my dearest love, that I am the sovereign and that business can stop and wait for nothing. Uh, Parliament is sitting and something occurs almost every day for which I may be required and it is quite impossible for me to be absent from London. Therefore, two or three days is already a long time to be absent. I am never easy a moment if I am not on the spot and see and hear what is going on. It kind of sounds like she's trying to justify like not being there for him or whatever. Maybe he demanded something of her, etc. So, Victoria was the only child of Edward, Duke of Kent. Her father died in 1820, and she was brought up in near isolation at Kensington Palace. She was permitted to know of her probable destiny at the age of ten. The occasion on which, according to legend, she exclaimed, I will be good. She succeeded on to the throne in 1837, when she was eighteen. That same year, Victoria was introduced to her cousin, Prince Albert of Sac Cobayac, and Gotha, a match much wished for her by her mother. But the new young queen was enjoying her first taste of independence and in no hurry to change her circumstances. It wasn't until Albert presented himself again in 1839 that she fell in love with him. Victoria, as queen, had to propose to Albert, which must have been the occasion for some auction awkwardness, but he accepted, and they were married on the 10th of February, 1840. Victoria's character, headstrong, stubborn, sociable, was transformed by marriage. Albert compensated for his wife's superior status with an absolute rule in the domestic sphere, and his punishment for wifely transgressions was the withdrawal of affection. Victoria, terrified of losing the husband upon whom she was increasingly reliant, would submit, and harmony would be restored. His letters, formerly addressed to beloved Victoria, now began, Dear child, the balance of power shifted further as the couple began to reproduce. Between 1840 and 1857, Victoria gave birth to nine children, all of whom, unusually for the time, survived to adulthood. By the 1840s, Albert was joint monarch in all but name. The fact he had no official title was a constant source of fretful regret to Victoria. She tried in 1854 and again in 1856 to have him declared prince, consort by parliament. When her second attempt failed, she conferred the title upon him herself. Albert was consulted by his wife in all matters of state, and she followed his direction. It is impossible to overstate how much Victoria depended on her husband. Her children were a distant second in her affections, and she would do nothing without his express approval. When he died in 1861, probably of stomach cancer, she was utterly inconsolable and plunged the court into a mourning so deep as to be quite spectacular even by the stringent standards of the time. She did not emerge again into the public gaze until 1872, and even then it was only at the urging of her most senior advisers who feared that republicanism was gaining a real foothold among the populace. The quote above is taken from a letter written to Albert ten days before their wedding. It reveals Victoria in her before state when she feels quite at ease asserting her authority over her husband to be. Yeah, that doesn't sound pleasant at all. It kind of sounds like Albert was like insecure in that you know, Victoria was a important person. She was a queen, and um, he, she had more like power than him. So he was trying to like insert lots of power in the domestic life to like conquer, I guess, because men are used to being like dominant or whatever. But I don't really know. So Empress Alexandra and Russia to Tsar. Nicholas II. So, Empress Alexander of Russia to Tsar Nicholas II sent from 
I'm not gonna say it to some place I can't pronounce. 4th of December 1916. Oh, that, that shows his name. Sorry. It's, um, I assume, yes. Goodbye, sweet, uh, lovey. It's great pain to let you go. Worse than ever. Worse than ever after the hard times we have been living and fighting through. But God, who is all love and mercy, has done the things to make a change for the better. Just a little more patience and deepest faith in the prayers and help of our friend. Then all will go well. I'm fully convinced that great and beautiful times are coming for your reign in Russia. Only keep up your spirit spirits. Alexandra and Nicholas, the Tsarevich of Russia, had fallen in love against the opposition, both of Alexandra's grandmother, Queen Victoria, and of Nicholas's father, the Tsar. So, but with Tsar in failing health, the objections were eventually overcome. He died on the 1st of November, 1894, later that month. Nicholas and Alexandra were married and Alexandra became Tsarina, but life at the Russian court proved problematic. The people suspected her of being pro-German, which became an even more serious problem with the outbreak of the First World War. The nobility thought her insufficiently grand to have become Empress and her mother-in-law, the Dowager Empress, did everything she could to undermine her, including openly sneering at the fact that after ten years of marriage, she had produced only daughters. Finally, in 1904, she gave birth to Alexia Tsarevich. Her joy and relief must have turned to anguish when she realized that he had inherited hemophilia, an often a fatal condition at the time. In despair of the fragile health of her son with doctors who were unable to offer any help, Alexandra turned to an array of healers, seers, and mystics, the most notorious of whom was Rasputin, a kind of non-aligned monk of shady background and no credentials. Rasputin became, if possible, even more unpopular with both the people and the nobility than excellent. Alexandra herself, and was murdered by a gang of courtiers in 1916. From some accounts of Alexandra's relationship with this charlatan, one might think she was single-handedly responsible for the Russian Revolution. But by 1917, the country was on its knees. Famine was widespread. The mismanaged war dragged on. Soldiers were opening fire on protesters, and the Tsar refused to con contemplate any kind of constitutional reform. After the February Revolution, Nicholas was forced to abdicate. He and his family were imprisoned by the Bolsheviks in various locations and finally taken to a house at Ekaterberg in the Urals. There, in the middle of the night of 1617, uh, July 1918, the entire family and three servants were taken by their guards from their sleeping quarters to the basement where, in a bloody chaos of bullets and bayonets, they were all killed Oscar Wilde and Lord Alfred Douglas. My sweet rose, my delicate flower, my lily of lilies. It is perhaps in prison that I'm going to test the power of love. I'm going to see if I cannot make the bitter water sweet by the intensity of the love. I hear you. I bear you. I have had moments when I thought it would be wiser to separate all moments of weakness and madness. Um, Oscar Wilde is a playwright, novelist, as he is critic, poet, and wit. Wilde married Constance Mary Lloyd at Dublin and Protestant in 1884. She gave birth to two sons in quick succession. In 1891, Wilde met Lord Alfred Douglas, son of the Marquess of Queensbury. His subsequent love affair with Bosey effectively ruined his life. In 1895, Douglas's father, famously aggressive, infuriated by his son's relationship with the Wilds, left a card at Wilds Club inscribed to Oscar Wilde, posing as some demite sick. Wilde made the unwise decision to sue for libel. The case went to court but was abandoned. The vindictive Marquess pursued Wilde to the office of the public prosecutor, which resulted in his standing trial on various counts of gross indecency. He was found guilty and sentenced to two years hard labor. He served his sentence at Bento Bentonville and then at Reading. Wilde left prison physically and psychologically destroyed. Popular belief has that he was abandoned by Douglas, but in fact, Lord Alfred wrote letters to the newspapers protesting the sentence and petitioned the Queen for clemency. On his release, Wilde drifted from place to place. Constance had not divorced him, but had moved away and changed her 
her and the children's surname. Frequently meeting up with Douglas, he died in a Paris hotel room in 1900, declaring a few days before on my wallpaper, and I are fighting a duel to the death of one or other of us has to go. So that's probably for, like, homophobic, I guess, reasons, or, yeah, probably the father of the guy he was in love with, you know. So Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, that's what I was talking about, so from Anne Boleyn to Henry VIII, the 6th of May, 1536, so you have chosen me from a low estate to be your queen and companion, far beyond my desert or desire, if then you found me worthy of such honour, good your grace, let not any light fancy or bad counsel of my enemies withdraw your princely favour from me, neither let that stain, the unworthy stain of dis a disloyal heart towards your grace ever cast, so foul a blot on your most dutiful wife and the infant princess, your daughter. So perhaps an unlikely unromantic choice, but it's undeniable the romance between Henry the Eighth and Anne Boleyn is one of the most infamous in history. Anne Boleyn was the daughter of Thomas Boleyn, Earl of Ormond and Elizabeth Howard. Thomas Boleyn was enormously ambitious for his three children and when at the age of 13 Anne was offered a position as a lady in waiting at the court of Margaret of Austria in Brussels, he saw it as an unmissable opportunity. Shortly after her arrival in Brussels, Anne was moved to France where she entered the service of Claude the Queen. The two became close and Anne required a polish and glamour that was immediately apparent when she returned to the English court in 1521. Accomplished, tasteful, witty and beautiful, dressed, uh, she was absolutely unlike her contemporaries. In 1526 or thereabouts, Anne caught the eye of Henry VIII. The king was ready for a new mistress, having recently dispensed with the services of Mary and sister. But it so happened that the vacancy coincided with Henry's growing conviction in the absence of a male heir, that his marriage to Catherine had never been valid. The element of heir, Henry's and Catherine's marriage and his subsequent marriage to Anne played out over the next six years. The political and religious fallout was huge and led ultimately to Henry's break with Rome and the establishment of the Church of England. The couple were finally married in January 1533 when Anne was just pregnant. Princess Elizabeth was born on the 7th of September. It was not a disaster for Anne that her first child was a girl. She was still young, but a miscarriage in August 1534 did not ogre well and she did not receive it conceive again until the autumn of 1535. In January 1536, Catherine died, which came as a relief to Henry and Anne, who knew how much support she and her... I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, no, no. Who knew how much support she and her daughter Mary retained in the country at large. This relief was short-lived, as Anne had another miscarriage at the end of the same month. Still, the situation might have been salvaged. Salvageville had not been for Anne's fallen out with the Lord Chancellor Thomas Cromwell. Anne had to go, and Thomas Cromwell arranged it. A mere divorce would not suffice. Anne and her faction had to be permanently dispatched, so Cromwell cooked up a selection of terrible charges, accusing her not only of incest relations with her brother George, but adultery of four other men of her circle, all were arrested and taken to the tower. After trials of non-existent legality, the Archbishop of Canterbury declared Anne and Henry's marriage in void on the grounds of Henry's previous association with Mary Boleyn. On the 19th of May, Anne was executed on Tower Green by a swordsman brought over from France in order to spare her the axe. Uh, on the 30th of May, Henry married Jane Seymour, one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting. So yeah, I did say Anne Boleyn had her head cut off. And yeah, I never really know the why, so they kind of like faked charged things that she did not do. Either way, like she didn't deserve to have her head cut off, but yeah, it seems unbelievable. I didn't know, like, he was already married to her sister at this time. And like, all of these ones are kind of saying, like, blaming the woman for having a daughter. Like, wash, they have no say in the matter. Like, if they could choose, they probably would choose a son just to get the other guy, the guy off her back, like, um, so, do, do, do. the Greek tale of Orpheus and Eurydice depicts a love that would stand the ultimate test of death itself. In this tale, Orpheus falls deeply in love with Eurydice 
and their happiness seems boundless until tragedy strikes and your dies, dies, heartbroken, Orpheus descends into the underworld to plead for her return. Moved by his devotion, hates the god of the dead and the kin of the underworld, agrees to let her return into the world of the living, but under one condition. Orpheus must not look back at her until they have reached the surface. Unfortunately, Orpheus cannot resist, and thus Eurydice is lost forever. The story shows us the power of love that transcends even death, and interestingly also teaches us the importance of trust and perseverance in the face of adversity. I don't want to reach the surface, but um, Marisa Saiba, so Marisa and Saiba is an Indian tale of forbidden romance between Marisa, a skilled archer, and Saiba, a village belle. Their love defies societal and familial expectations and sets the stage for a tragic narrative. Despite the deep affection shared between Mirza and Saiba. Their union is plagued by betrayal. Saiba's family orchestrates a plan to separate them, leading Saiba unwittingly betraying Mirza's trust. At the power of love, wins as Mirza not only forgives her, but even sacrifices his life for her. Their tragic story throws a light on how love can be complicated and how lovers tend to find strength even when things get difficult. Um, Tristan and Isolate. Tristan and Isolate is a legendary medieval tale of forbidden love that has captivated people for centuries. The story follows an ill fated romance between Tristan, a knight of Cornwall, and Isolate, also known as Insulate, an Irish prince. Princess, sorry. In this tale, although Insulate is betrothed to someone else, she deeply falls. She falls deeply in love with Tristan, despite their best efforts to suppress their feelings. Tristan and Isolata could not deny their love for each other, and that ultimately led to tragic consequences. The complexities of love and passion are thrown in abundance in this beloved tragedy. Subashi, Rao, First, and Mastani. The love story of Pashi Rao the First and Mastani is a legendary one that has been immortalized in Indian folklore, literature, and cinema. Pashi Rao the First was a renowned uh, Peshwa of the Martha, Martha Empire, while Mastani, Mastani was a princess of Bundel. Uh, Bundelkhand. The relationship faced opposition from. Bashi's aroused family and society due to their cultural differences and social statuses. Despite humongous challenges, Bashi Rao and Mastani's love for each other kept growing stronger, enduring several obstacles in their lifetime. In fact, their love story continues to be celebrated for transcending boundaries and societal norms even today. So, Romeo and Juliet, perhaps the most iconic love stories of all time. William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet follows the romance between Romeo, a member of the Montag family, and Juliet, a member of the rival Capulet family. Romeo and Juliet fall in love despite their family's long-standing feud. The young still marry each other secretly in hopes of ending the conflict between their families. However, their love is doomed from the start, and the story ends tragically with both lovers taking their own lives. In Romeo and Juliet, we see the consequence of divisive of hatred and violence that are often hurled at instant love. So, I'm sure you've heard of the story. I actually haven't read it myself, despite being in English, advanced English, when I was in school in France. We, I missed, they read Romeo and Juliet before I came there, and then we moved on to other ones, like... But I hadn't yet done Romeo and Juliet in my school. We were going to do it the year I left or the year after or something. So I never actually did the play or greet in it and stuff. But what we did, like, came Lear and then Macbeth. And then in advanced English, we did Hamlet. So I had, like, two Shakespeare plays one year. I don't know, because I was in advanced English. And basically, it's not, you know... I was in the English section, so we did everything through English, but the advanced English was basically three extra classes of English a week, and we already had, like, four of the other ones, so, like, seven classes of English a week, and we did, like, a more analysis and stuff. At the end, we 
had the exam in the advanced English and the orals, but for the mocks I had to do both. So there was like three essays on each of these um, exams, you know. So I did have to know all the texts. But yeah, her friend Gia here and Gia find themselves in the list of most epic love stories in Indian folklore. In fact, their lives have been immortalized in Punjabi literature and folk songs. The heartwarming story revolves around Hare, a beautiful woman, and Ranja, a handsome musician who, despite belonging to different social classes, fall in love. The union faces opposition from Hare's family, leading to tragic consequences. This tale of undying love is celebrated for its poetic beauty and timeless appeal. So, yeah. Next up, we have Paris and Hélène. I'm not sure if it's Elena, Helen, or how you say it. So, she was another man's wife, but when Paris, the handsome, woman-mad Prince of Troy, saw Elaine, the woman uh, whom Aphrodite uh, proclaimed the most beautiful in the world, he had to have her. Elaine and Paris ran off together as then motioned the decade-long Troya. Trojan War. According to myth, Ellen was half to find the daughter of Queen Leda and the god Zeus, who transformed into a swan to seduce the queen. Whether um, Ellen actually existed, we'll never know, but her romantic part in the greatest epic of all time can never be forgotten. She will forever be the face that launched thousand ships. Uh, Cleopatra and Mark Mark Anthony, so brilliant to look upon and listen to with the power to subjugate everyone. That was the description of Cleopatra, queen of Egypt. She could have had anything or anyone she wanted, but she fell passionately in love with the Roman general, Mark Anthony. Anthony, is it? Not sure. There's no H, actually, as Shakespeare depicts it. The relationship was volatile. Phil, don't you see now that I could have poisoned you a hundred times had I been able to live without you, Cleopatra said. But have they risked all in a war on Roman loss? They chose to die together in 30 BC. I will be a bridegroom in my death and run into it as to a lover's bed, said Antony, and Cleopatra followed by clasping a poisonous asp to her breast. Hadrian and Antinous, I'm saying it every of these people's names, Ron. We've heard of the wall. No, not that one. The second century AD one stretching across England. But what about the emperor Hadrian's heart? He lost it to Antinous far left. An intelligent, sport loving Greek student. The emperor displayed an obsessive craving for his presence. The two traveled together, pursuing their love of hunting. Hunting Hadrian once saved his lover's life during a lion hunt. The emperor even wrote erotic poetry. While visiting the Nile, Antinous drowned mysteriously, but some say he was murdered by those jealous of the emperor's devotion. The devastated Hadrian proclaimed Antinous a deity, ordered a city to be built in his honor, and named a star after him between the eagle and the zodiac. So Henry II and Rosamund Clifford, uh, the first play Plantagen, Plantagen, a king of England, had a rich royal wife in Eleanor of Anquitaine and mistresses galore, but the love of his life was fair Rosamund, also called the Rose of the World. To conceal their affair, Henry built a love nest in the innermost recesses of the mass in his park at Woodstock. Nonetheless, the story has it that Queen Eleanor did not rest until she found the labyrinth and traced it to the center, um, where she uncovered her ravishing rival. The queen offered her death by blade or poison. Rosamund chose the poison, perhaps not coincidentally. Henry kept Eleanor confined in prison for 16 years of their marriage. Um, Dante and Beatrice so rarely has a woman served as such profound inspiration for a writer, and yet he barely knew her. The Italian poet Dante Alighieri wrote passionately of Beatrice in the Divine Comedy and other poems, but only met the object of his affection twice. The first time he was nine years old and 
she was eight the second time they were adults and walking the street in Florence. Beatrice, an emerald-eyed beauty, turned and greeted Dante before continuing on her way. Beatrice eyed at eight twenty-four and twelve ninety without Dante ever seeing her again. Nonetheless, she was a glorious lady of my mind, he wrote, and she is by Beatitude. I am the story of all vice and the queen of virtue, virtue, salvation. So, Louis the fifteenth of France and Madame de Pompadour. So, in 1730, a Parisian prof prophetess told a nine-year-old girl she would rule the heart of a king. Years later, at a mass ball, Jean-Antoinette Poisson, dressed as the domino, danced with King Louis the Conscient, or 15th, I don't know, and dressed as a tree. Within weeks, the delicate beauty was a maîtresse en tête, giving the title Marquise de Pompadour. Any man would have wanted her as his mistress, said another male admirer. The couple indulged in their love of art, furniture, and porcelain. With Madame de Pompadour arranging for a jaded royal lover, small dinner parties, and amateur theatricals in which she would star, of course, while watching one play, Louis XV declared, you are the most delicious woman in France before sweeping her out of the room. So John and Abigail Adams, uh, Abigail Smith, married the founding father at age 20, gave birth to five children, including America's fifth president, John Quincy Adams, and was John Adams' confidant, uh, political advisor, and first lady. The more than 1,000 letters they wrote to each other offer a window into John and Abigail's mutual devotion and abiding friendship. It was more than revolutionary political ideals that kept them so united. They shared a trust and abiding tenderness. Abigail wrote, There is a tie more binding than humanity and stronger than friendship. And by this court, I am not ashamed to say that I am bound, nor do I believe that you are wholly free from it. Uh, as for Johnny wrote, I want to hear you think or see your thoughts. The conclusion of your letter makes my heart throb more than I cannot cannot would you bid me burn your letters but i must forget you first mary godwin shelley and percy shelley so when the unromantic poet percy shelley met mary godwin she was a teenage daughter of a famous trailblazing feminist the lawn dead mary Stonecraft. The two of them shared a love, the mind, soul meets soul, on lover's lips, he wrote, but physical desire swept them away too, consummated near the grave of Mary's mother. When they ran away to Europe, it caused a major scandal, but the couple proclaimed themselves indifferent to judgment. It was acting novel, being an incarnate romance. She later said they traveled together to visit the debauched Lord Byron and Mary wrote Frankenstein during two weeks in Switzerland. After Percy died in a boat accident in 1822, Mary never remarried. She said having been married to a genius, she could not marry a man who wasn't one. So, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning. So, Elizabeth Barrett was an accomplished and respected poet in poor health and nearly 40 years old when Robert Browning wrote to her, I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett, and praising their fresh, strange music, the affluent language, the exquisite pathos, and true, new, brave thought. They courted in secret because of her family's disapproval. She wrote, I am not of a cold nature and cannot bear to be treated coldly when cold water is thrown upon a hot iron and the iron hisses. They married in 1846, living among fellow writers and artists for the rest of the her life. When she died, it was in Robert Browning's arms. So, John Keats and Fanny Braun, the celebrated young poet's romance with his neighbor, Fanny Braun, sparked was probably his most famous poem, Bright Star, though the relationship was fraught, fraught with jealousy. Braun was a precocious and flirtatious young woman. Keats, a fiercely overzealous part, the two clashes often as they Coasiled, I'm not sure he's But the full recognition of their love was hindered by Keats' lack of money and his own illness, bedridden by tuberculosis, while he contract which he contracted from his late brother and mother, Keats yearned in envy over his conquetish brawn, whose frivolous nature marred her love for the young poet and subsequently aggravated his well being. Though engaged in brawn, Keats had to end the engagement in an effort to get well in Rome. He died there not long after his arrival, his romance to remain unrequited. So Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas, for nearly 40
famous for their literary salon in Paris, which was frequented by Picasso, T.S. Eliot, E. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, and many more. When Douglas, far left, first met Stein, she wrote, It was Gertrude Stein who held my complete attention, as she did for all the many years I knew her until her death, and all those empty ones since then. She was a golden brown presence, burned by the Tuscan sun, and with a golden glint in her warm brown hair. Their love to gain international fame after Stein published, Stein published, that autobiography of Alice B. Douglas wrote, Stein, one must dare to be happy. Uh, oh yeah, Diego Rivera and Frido Kahlo. The talented young Mexican painter Kahlo paid a visit to the studio of famous muralist Rivera in search of career advice. She had unusual dignity and self-assurance, and there was a strange fire in her eyes, he said. There was a volatile relationship, yet Rivera knew from early on that Gala was the most important fact in my life, and she would continue to be until she died 27 years later. As for Gala, she said, you deserve a lover who listens when you sin, who supports you when you feel shame, and respects your freedom, who flies with you and isn't afraid to fall. You deserve a lover who takes away the lies and brings you hope, coffee, and poetry. So, I believe that is all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be seeing you in the next one. So.